Hi guys, my name is Minas and today we're going to be talking about the embryological development of the placenta. And as usual, I've broken it down into very simple steps so that if you're completely new to embryology, you still will be able to understand everything by the end of this video. Now guys, before we get into the rest of the video, I just wanted to bring you a quick message from the sponsor of this video, BNX. BNX is an American company and their MERV 13 filters, which are made in America, so you know that it's a high quality product, they're made using a special electrostatically charged filter media. And this essentially means it can remove up to 95% of the harmful microscopic particles that can cause allergies, asthma, or any other kind of breathing difficulties if you're especially prone to it. Do you have a garden with flowers? Is there lots of pollen? Do you have any allergies? Do you have any dust mites? Is your house particularly dusty? Or how about, do you have a pet? Is there a dog, a couple of cats? Are you worried about mold, especially in the humid times? Do you have a fireplace? Is there smoke? How about are you living on a main road with lots of car pollution? Is there someone in your house that smokes? Is there a neighbor that's doing construction? If you said yes to any of those things, essentially that's a reason why to get a BNX MERV 13 air filter. You will get around the clock protection from those things. The development of the placenta begins at implantation. And we've actually discussed this bit in a lot more detail in the introduction to embryology video, which is popping up there and you can click to watch if you want. But essentially what's important to know for this video is that this blastula that does implant into the uterine wall contains both an inner cell mass in purple and an outer cell mass in orange. The inner cell mass has two parts, an epiblast and a hypoblast. What makes you up is epiblast. And so essentially the inner cell mass will contribute to the hypoblast and the epiblast. But we can ignore that for this video. Importantly, let's focus on the outer cell mass, mass which is essentially the trophoblast. And the trophoblast is responsible for invading the uterine epithelium and it's the trophoblast that helps make the placenta. This trophoblast by day eight will differentiate into two structures. It differentiates into the syncytiotrophoblast and the cytotrophoblast. The syncytiotrophoblast also is responsible for secreting the human chorionic gonadotropin and the HCG is what's picked up in the bedside pregnancy tests as well as the serum pregnancy tests. It's a test of beta HCG. Now paying attention to this. Now this is the epithelium of the uterus. So now this is actually inside the uterine wall. Imagine that it's no longer in the canal, but this is inside the uterine, canal, uh, uterine wall. Now we've got color coded in green, the syncytiotrophoblast, and in blue, the cytotrophoblast. We can completely ignore what's going on in the middle here, just for now, as it contains the rest of embryology. Now around day nine, the syncytiotrophoblast will form lacunae paying attention again to here. We have these holes that form within the syncytiotrophoblast. And these holes are the initial stages of the fetal circulation. Essentially, they will eventually form a network of tunnels which will be filled by blood. And as the syncytiotrophoblast further invades into the maternal tissue, blood from the maternal supply is allowed to enter these holes and now the circulation is formed. And this happens by the end of the second week. Now as the syncytiotrophoblast is further invading into the maternal tissue and this blood supply begins, at the same time the cytotrophoblast is growing these finger-like projections called the primary villi. And here we have some finger-like projections that are growing into 
the syncytiotrophoblast. We can see the lacunae here that is filled with blood, the chorionic plate surrounding the embryo that is containing the chorionic cavity. Now these primary villi are growths into the syncytiotrophoblast. And when extra embryonic mesoderm from here, from the fetus, enters into the primary villi, they become secondary villi. And these secondary villi, once the extra embryonic mesoderm penetrates it, will become tertiary villi when there is a blood supply finally attached to it. Paying attention to this. It's a differentiated version of this. And to keep it simple, step one, step two, step three, step four. We are no longer color coded over here, but to explain what's happening, we have the embryo here with the umbilical cord. And this umbilical cord will contain the blood supply to and from the developing baby. Over here, we have a vein from mum, an artery from mum, and we have our villi over here. And the villi that are tertiary have their blood supply. The tertiary villi will grow into the decidua basalis, and decidua basalis is mum's tissue. The decidua basalis is the same bit of tissue, it's the same makeup of tissue as the decidua capsularis. And I haven't color coded it anything, it's just in clear space, but this is all tissue. It's all mum's tissue. And the decidua basalis and the decidua capsularis are essentially the same bit of tissue, but they have different names because of the different location. The decidua basalis is here at the, we can just say the base to remember it better, the stalk of where the fetus is and where all of the main blood supply is, whereas the decidua capsularis is here in the more, let's just say, barren area. Over here, we can see that there's the outer cytotrophoblast shell. Here's the chorionic cavity. And in between the villi is the intervillous space. Now the tertiary villi can actually anchor into the tissue that belongs to mum, and they're called anchored villi or anchoring villi. And these anchoring villi will further form more branches to increase the surface area so that more nutrient and metabolite exchange can happen. Imagine a tree that's growing outwards, upwards with further development of its branches just so that it can cover as much area of sun as possible for photosynthesis. This is, think of that as an exact same way. The villi further branch to cover more surface area so that they can have more nutrient exchange. Now, this is a close-up, so let's take this section here and bring it, zoom it out so that we can see what's actually happening. And here we have the whole blood supply of the fetus. Ignoring this part just for now, let's just see what's going on over here. We have the decidua basalis here, and that is studded with veins and arteries from mum. Remember, decidua basalis belongs to mum, it's from mum. And here we have the chorionic plate, which is from extra embryonic mesoderm. And here are our villi. This one is an anchoring villi, as you can see, because it's anchored in, it's stuck to the decidua basalis. In purple on the outside, that's the muscle of the uterus, the myometrium. And in the inner purple, line, that's the cytotrophoblastic shell. Now let's have a look at what's going on over here. We have the spiral arteries bringing blood into the intervillous space. It's pouring blood in. This blood is picked up by the umbilical veins, which are in red, and sent all the way to the fetus. And the umbilical arteries are bringing blood back out to go back to mum. The cytotrophoblast 
is also responsible for invading the maternal blood supply. And what it does to the spiral arteries is that it increases its diameter so that more blood can flow and with less resistance. A clinical correlate of a failure or an incomplete differentiation of the cytotrophoblast to actually do this process is called preeclampsia, which is characterized by high blood pressure, hypertension, and proteinuria, protein in the urine. And it can be fatal to baby and mum. It can result in eclampsia, which is characterized by seizures. And essentially the cure to this is the birth of the baby. Now let's talk about the circulation of the fetus. We are getting blood supply, oxygenated blood, coming down the umbilical vein, which is in red, and it's a vein because it's taking blood to the heart. Arteries and veins don't have their name because they're either oxygenated or not. It's all about the direction of blood flow. So essentially, it's an artery if it's moving away from the heart, and it's a vein if it's moving towards the heart. Now let's talk about the blood supply and circulation of the fetus. We have oxygenated blood coming through the umbilical vein, and the umbilical vein is connected, or it supplies both to the liver and to the ductus venosus. Now the ductus venosus is a temporary structure, which it becomes a ligament after birth. The ligament is called the ligamentum venosum. But before birth, it's used to supply blood. And so this oxygenated blood comes up into the in through the ductus venosus into the inferior vena cava and it goes into the right atrium. It mixes with blood that is brought to the right atrium from the superior vena cava down here. This blood shunts into the left atrium and also moves into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle it moves into the pulmonary trunk and then into the pulmonary arteries. And from the pulmonary arteries, it can either go to the lungs or it can go through the patent ductus arteriosus into the aorta. Now the ductus arteriosus is responsible for shunting blood from the pulmonary artery into the aorta. And because these lungs, these pre-birth lungs, are filled with amniotic fluid, they can't oxygenate the blood, and therefore there's no point for blood to essentially go to them. And this shunt serves to bypass these lungs, and so that oxygenated blood can go to the rest of the organs. So this is the descending aorta now, and it will go to the lower limbs and to the rest of the, the organs that need it. Blood goes down to the lower limbs, and the from the aorta and the iliac artery, the internal iliac artery sends blood back to, through the umbilical veins back to the placenta. Now this ductus arteriosus will close and become a ligament at birth or around that time. But it can actually be useful when there is a severe congenital heart issue. If a child, for example, is born with a transposition of the great vessels, this ductus arteriosus being patent can mean the difference between them living or not, initially. A surgeon may wish to administer prostaglandin so that this ductus arteriosus remains open while they prepare for the surgery. So prostaglandin E2 will be administered to the baby so that the ductus arteriosus does not close, so it remains patent, and so that blood can continue, oxygenated blood, can continue to be supplied to the body. So what are the main functions of the placenta? Just pause the video and take this for your notes. That was a page from a book that I wrote to simplify embryology. Thank you so much for watching and continuing to support these videos that I make twice a year. I really appreciate all of the comments, the likes, etc. 
Thank you so much. I read all of the comments. I, I respond to all the direct messages that I get. And I'm very grateful and thankful for all of your love and support. Thank you, guys.